Okay, I uh, think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out today and also welcome out our audience who's in the overflow room uh, across the hall there. Um, I have a couple quick announcements before I, I introduce our panel uh, for this evening. We have uh, two uh, more Foley events before this semester ends um, next week. The first is on uh, Tuesday, April 25th at noon here in the Foley Institute, we'll, and there'll be pizza available for those of you who come for our pizza at our noon events. It's going to be a panel discussion about the French election, which should be quite interesting since the runoff is taking, or the first round of the election is taking place uh, this weekend, and so we'll know who the final two candidates are going to be in the runoff election by then. And we have two uh, uh, experts on French politics who will be discussing uh, the, the, the French election and its implications for the future of Europe. Then on Thursday, April 27th at 6 p.m. in the Cup Auditorium, we uh, are fortunate we're one of the few universities across the country that's been uh, selected to actually screen a film. Um, it's a, a, a film entitled Tickl uh, Tickling Giants. It's uh, produced by Sarah Taxler, who's a producer on the Samantha Bee program, if any of you watch that. Um, and it's about Basim Yosef, who has uh, been, been called the Egyptian um, uh, John Stewart. He's a comedian who played a really important role in this, uh, the Arab Spring in Egypt. He was put in prison because of his satirical uh, comments about the government there and uh, has went right back at it afterwards. Uh, and so it should, it's going to be a really interesting and fun film to watch, I think, so I encourage you to come that at 6 p.m. in the Cub Auditorium. We're co-sponsoring that with the Student Entertainment Board. And then one other event, which is not a Foley event, but I'm going to announce it anyways, it's tonight. The Young Democrats, the College Republicans, and the Young Americans for Freedom are holding a debate this evening between 7 and 8. That's also in the Cub Auditorium. They're going to be talking about the direction of America in an era of Trump. So that should be interesting. I encourage you to go to that as well. But tonight, we're fortunate. We have a very distinguished panel to talk about uh, refugees, human rights, and national security. So last year, the United States took in about uh, 80,000 refugees, which uh, was slightly up from the previous five years, but was actually a decline from uh, uh, the numbers of refugees the United States took in throughout much of the 1980s and 1990s when it was not uncommon for our country to take in between 100 and 150,000 refugees annually. The Trump administration has proposed to reduce this uh, number still further in the coming years. By contrast, other, members are, uh, other countries are today taking in far more refugees, both in absolute numbers and in terms of a proportion of their population. In the current refugee crisis in Europe, for instance, Germany alone took in uh, more than a million refugees during the past two years. The influx of refugees in Europe and the perception of an influx of refugees in the United States, as well as the fact that many of these refugees are now coming from uh, regions of the world uh, that are associated with global terrorism, such as the Middle East and North Africa, has sparked growing political controversies both in the United States and in Europe. It's helping to fuel uh, the surge in populist and nationalist fervor in both these uh, uh, in both the United States and Europe, and many people I think are confused about both the number and the nature of refugees in the United States, and uh, whether we should, there's a basis for some legitimate concerns. So, what is the refugee experience in this country? How should we think about refugees, human rights, and whether they pose security threats? To discuss all this, we have, like I say, a really excellent panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce them, and then they're each going to spend. Uh, Oh, 15, uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, talking about this issue, and then we're going to open up for uh, Q&A. We're going to end tonight probably uh, right around 7.30 or maybe a little after. Uh, and if any of you are here for a class, uh, there'll be sign-up sheets uh, available at the end of the uh, event. Uh, they'll be out, out, uh, out in the lobby. Um, our our uh, first speaker tonight is actually one of my colleagues here at WSU. It's Dr. Ashley Townsend. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the School of Politics, uh, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. Ashley's research focuses on terrorism, civil wars, protest movements, and peacekeeping. In particular, Ashley seeks to explain the psychological factors and personality traits that lead individuals to join violent protest uh, and, rebel, or, and terrorist groups. He has published widely, and his work has appeared in outlets such as the Journal of International Peacekeeping and International Studies Review. Ashley earned his BA from Sam Houston State and received his doctorate in political science from the University of Illinois. He will be uh, 
He'll be talking to us uh, about the relationship between uh, refugees and terrorism and violence. And then following him, we have uh, two visiting scholars with us. We have Dr. Uh, Thorin Wright, who's in the center there. Ashley's on the far right. Uh, Dr. Thorin Wright, who's a, an assistant professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State University in Tempe. He completed his PhD in political science also at the University of Illinois, and his primary research examines the uh, dynamics of state uh, repression and human rights practices. His published works have appeared in outlets such as the Journal of Conflict Resolution, the Journal of Peace Research, and International Studies Quarterly. And uh, joining him in his presentation is uh, Dr. Shweta Murthy. I knew I was going to get it wrong. Murthy. <laughs> who is a principal researcher at the Coalition for Communities of Color in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Shweta uh, directs the research program there, which aims at using, uh, or at, at, at conducting and employing empirical research to advance racial justice. Her responsibilities include conducting research projects on racial disparities in the region, advocating for better data gathering by government agencies, and providing research assistance in support of legislation around racial justice issues. Before joining, uh, the uh, communities of color. Uh, Shweta was an assistant professor in political science at Northern Illinois University where she conducted research on forced migration. Shweta uh, earned her master's from Nehru University in India and her doctor is also from the University of Illinois. This is kind of the University of Illinois <laughs> show over here tonight. Uh, and, uh, and, and she and Dr. Wright will uh, be talking a little bit about the ex uh, immigrant experience in, in the United States and also the relationship to human rights. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Townsend. So I just uh, want to begin by thanking Cornell uh, and the Foley Institute uh, for hosting this event. Um, I'm relatively new to the WSU community. This is uh, only my second year here on campus. Um, and I have been... Um, very, very uh, happy with what the Foley offers. Uh, uh, the students here and uh, the Foley community in general, I think these are great events. I think they allow us to look at um, important uh, topics with some, um, some academic rigor and some, um, some depth that uh, it's not available everywhere. Um, and so I'm, I'm very pleased and happy to be part of one of these because um, I've been sitting uh, in the audience for the last two years watching um, as many of these as I could, I could, possibly, get a, uh, could possibly attend. Um, so I think these are great great resource and I, um, I want to thank everybody for coming out and watching us uh, present this, uh, this work today. Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, refugees and security. Uh, as, uh, as you heard, uh, my expertise is uh, really in, uh, uh, in terrorist organizations and rebel group organizations, and, uh, how these organizations form, how they operate, where they operate, uh, which individuals join these organizations, which individuals don't join these organizations. Uh, and then I also say the back end of the conflict of peacekeeping and uh, post-conflict societies and that sort of So my portion of the talk today is going to be focused on the relationship between um, refugee populations, refugee flows, and the security um, in relation to terrorism and terrorist attacks um, that that potentially leads to. Um, that's a, a question that has been um, in the news uh, for, for the, this past presidential election and means that today. It's also an interest about Europe. Um, so it's an open um, concern for a lot of people. And so what, we're, what I'm going to be showing you today is first, um, how refugees go about getting in the U.S. And we're going to look at some of the data and analytical and empirical work on the relationship between terrorism and refugees. And then we're going to look at some kind of um, uh, some implications of that research for, uh, for uh, crafting policies that states make about how many refugees they can allow in and how that process works. Right? Um, so I'm sorry my slide's a little bit small here. Um, they will get bigger as we go ahead. Um, so first here, uh, what I wanted to clarify, um, which I think is important as we begin this talk, is um, how do refugees actually come to the U.S.? What is this process? So um, there's a lot of confusion about how this process works. And really, um, for the vast majority of refugees, um, um, in this past year in 2016, about 80% of the refugees that entered the U.S. entered through this process that I'm going to talk about. Um, there, it really is a four-step process. And so the way refugees um, get admitted to the United States is first, before they do anything having to do with the U.S., is they apply to the United Nations for refugee status. Right? And um, they apply to a, a U.N. agency called uh, UNHCR. 
And what this agency does before the U.S. is ever contacted is they begin to vet these refugees. Um, they collect biometric data like fingerprints and uh, iris scans. Um, they also correct, uh, collect biographical data on all these individuals. They collect medical data on all these individuals. And they collect um, data on the locations of these individuals' families, both in the country from where they're coming and in the places where they would potentially uh, be going. Um, and so the UN begins this process um, that is a, a, a very, very rigorous process about who gets classified as a refugee in the first place. Um, and then that's only first, uh, the first, uh, first and second step. Um, and so um, to give you kind of a contextual uh, example of how this step filters out people who eventually show up in the U.S. or potential refugees that show up in the U.S., um, uh, there are about, right now, um, 4 million Syrian refugees that have the potential to apply to this UN program, right? 4 million. Um, of those 4 million, um, only about 29,000 in 2016 made it to step three. Right? So of the 4 million, um, all the ones that applied, only 29,000 made it through one step, uh, step one and two. A big portion of those 4 million didn't apply in the first place, and a big portion of those 4 million applied, and then their, some of their collection of data couldn't be verified, and so they weren't um, continued down the policy. Um, the third step in which, the way in which refugees show up in the U.S. is once the U.N. has verified this information, then they um, essentially give the U.S. this information, and the U.S. then is allowed to pick out of all the refugees that pass through those first two steps, which ones they will allow in the U.S. And they don't pick them um, in a random fashion. The U.S. again does something very similar to the United Nations in that they go and interview these potential refugees, uh, or these refugees who are trying to get into the, uh, uh, to the United States. They are, no, they are, they are refugees. Um, and they collect uh, very similar data. They do a background check. This background check is run um, by all, uh, all four of these organizations, the FBI, the National Center for Terrorism, um, the Homeland, uh, Homeland uh, Security Department, the Department of Homeland Security, and the State Department. All four of these organizations run a background check on every individual who is a potential entrance to the U.S. as a refugee. Um, and then there's something called recurrent vetting, in which these individuals are continually run through these programs and continually background checked by all four of these organizations. Then they again collect biometric data, like fingerprints and other scans. They again do another medical check, and then they go through cultural orientation. Right? And so, before a refugee ever shows up on U.S. soil through the U.N. refugee program, and through the program that the U.S. allows refugees to come into, or at least the vast majority of refugees to enter, they have been vetted both by the UN and by four different agencies within the US. Right? And to give you a, a contextual example again, um, uh, of the 29,000 individuals uh, from the Syrian conflict of 2016 that yeah, passed through the UN security that were given to the UN the US as potential options to let in, the UN, UN, uh, US only let in a little over 12,000 in 2016. Um, so you can see we started with the potential four, the number of 4 million. Uh, Syrian refugees, and they got filtered down all the way to only 12,000, a little over 12,000 got elected. So what I'm trying to explain and, and uh, uh, emphasize here is that uh, the refugees who entered the U.S. in particular are vetted incredibly well. And this is not something that's new, it's something that's been going on um, through the U.S. Uh, refugee policy for a long time. Right? So this, this vetting process is uh, stable. It is extensive, um, and so the individuals who show up in the U.S. as um, as as part of the, the refugee admittance program are individuals who have been extremely vetted. Now, um, given that, I want to look at the relationship for a second between refugees and terrorism, right? And I'm going to tell you something here that um, I'm going to tell you two different things here. Um, about the relationship between refugees and terrorists. And these two things are often conflated in the media as being the same thing, and they fundamentally are not. And um, those two things is that there is evidence, um, uh, academic, empirical, reliable evidence, that there is a relationship between refugee populations and terrorism. Now, that evidence is often cited in the media as a reason why refugees should be not admitted to the U.S. or might have not admitted to the European states, but that's a misunderstanding of the way in which the evidence works. 
The evidence in the relationship between refugees and terrorist attacks has nothing to do with the refugees that inflow into Europe or inflow into the world. It has to do with um, the um, concentration of refugees for a long period of time in specific <coughs> locations, generally right outside of the places in which the conflict that they're fleeing starts, right? So we're talking about a different type of refugee population than the one that enters into the other countries. And in fact, when we make this distinction, there is almost no evidence that there's a relationship between terrorists and types of refugees. When we drill a little bit deeper, we understand the type of refugees that go through these programs that end up in Europe and end up in the US. Right? That this, this relationship that you sometimes hear about in the news and the media about the relationship between refugees and terrorism is fundamentally misunderstood. That there really isn't a relationship between terrorists and types of refugees. Um, when you consider the types of refugees, the, the, the vetting program that they go into to enter both European and US population. Right? Um, in addition, the last point I want to make is that um, terrorist organizations are not, um, they're not dumb. And if terrorist organizations want to get individuals into European countries or get individuals into the US, doing it through a refugee program is an incredibly um, inefficient way to do it. Um, having people vetted through um, this incredibly um, rigorous uh, process to have an individual in it is not the way in which ISIS or Al Qaeda would go about trying to infiltrate European or US uh, populations, right? But this refugee and terrorist relationship is fundamentally missing. Um, and then I want to talk about counterpoint to this terrorism refugee um, uh, relationship that is sometimes talked about, um, but I think is, uh, doesn't get enough, atten enough attention to this is true. Um, and that is that there is quite a bit of evidence out there, and a growing uh, amount of evidence out there, that terrorist organizations use um, uh, rhetoric about refugees, both in Europe and in the U.S., as a recruitment tool to grow their organizations. And we have two distinct um, examples of this in the last uh, year and a half. Okay? The first is that um, Al-Shabaab, which is an Al-Qaeda offshoot um, that exists mostly in Somalia, uh, released a video in January 2016 in which there's a 51 minute long video of um, the leaders from Al-Shabaab um, ranting about um, the rhetoric of refugee policies in Europe and the United States as an example of Muslims not being welcomed in the US. They're doing this as a um, recruitment tool to try to get individuals to join their organizations Right? So the rhetoric, of the anti-refugee rhetoric in both Europe and the U.S. is used by Al-Shabaab in this video very clearly and distinctly as a recruiting tool to try to influence people's opinion about the relationship between Islam and the West. Um, additionally, we have another example of this. Um, ISIS in a post-Brussels attack video um, uh, used clips of, uh, of Donald Trump's uh, comments during the campaign as justification for the attack, and is again as recruiting tools saying that the, um, the Muslim public population in Brussels should join ISIS in response to the rhetoric coming out of the 2016. Right? So this is another example of a video of a, of a terrorist organization using rhetoric about refugees as a recruiting tool. So we've seen it from both Al Qaeda and from ISIS uh, in, in relatively in the recent issues. This is Something that um, uh, is important to note when we talk about uh, refugee policy and when we talk about the relationship between terrorism and refugees, it's not simply about attacks, but it's about how the rhetoric affects the recruitment policy as well. Um, so why do terrorist organizations make these policies? Why do they use these policies to recruit? And they do it because of the one-size-fits-all nature of the uh, anti-refugee uh, uh, rhetoric that's been floating around. They use this kind of um, uh, 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 one-size-fits-all narrative about the relationship between Islam and the West as a way to solidify what they see as an us versus them dynamic and an us versus them argument. So ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda both use this rhetoric to say, um, we were right. We told you that the West does not like Islam and does not like Muslims. And um, this rhetoric that you're seeing 
um, on the news and the TV that they put in their videos as an example of that, and you're right, so come and join us. Okay, so that's the dynamic. That's the reason why they're using these videos, because they already have built up this ice versus them uh, mythology, right? And they use these videos and this rhetoric to reinforce that mythology to the people that are potential victims. Um, so lastly, I want to talk about ref U.S. refugee policy and talk about how um, a lot of people talk about this being a, a risk versus risk uh, calculation. And so I, I don't particularly like that language because I think it, it leaves out the rewards of letting in refugees into the country, which I think are substantial. But, uh, the economic rewards, the social rewards, the morality rewards. Um, but this risk versus risk policy uh, debate is kind of the, the hot one going on now, so I'll use that language. And um, so we have basically two different risks, right? We have the risk of letting in a large population of refugees and the terrorism risk that comes with that, which I hope to show you that the empirical evidence shows that there's very little, but that risk is, is uh, minimal and very manageable. And we also have the risk of uh, creating a very strict refugee policy in which we don't let a lot of refugees in. Um, and that brings with it a risk of, uh, of inflaming and allowing terrorist organizations to use it as a recruiting tool. Right? So we have another risk. So this is, that's where the risk versus risk policy language comes from. And I think, and I think the evidence clearly backs up, that that second risk, that risk of not letting in refugees, is actually much more dangerous. It's, it's substantial and it's uncontrolled. Where well, the risk of, of letting a bunch of refugees in and having the, the potential relationship between the terrorist attacks is, is not only minimal, but it's quite manageable. Right? So I'm going to turn um, it over to my colleagues, my four. My expert colleagues here that are, uh, are going to speak about uh, human rights and the relationship <coughs> between human rights and human rights. All right, thank you, Ashley. Um, I'm uh, Thorin Wright again, uh, and Shweta and I are going uh, to summarize uh, a research project that we did together uh, that was recently published uh, that examines um, a global sample of host states states that are hosting refugees uh, and examine uh, the linkages between hosting refugees uh, and the human rights practices of those host states. Um, so what I mean by human rights is, is uh, fairly simple. There's a, a pretty simple concept behind that. Th these are the rights afforded to all of us um, based on the fact that we are human beings. Um, it's described uh, in detail in the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, there are several international treaties uh, that specify these rights that uh, most countries have signed on to. Uh, and the one that in, in some ways is the most relevant for this discussion uh, is the 1951 UN Convention on Refugees, um, which most uh, states in the world have signed on to. Uh, in human rights research, um, especially the cross-national research and the, uh, the kind that uh, I uh, take part in, uh, we have largely focused on uh, a subset of those full listed rights uh, in, the, in the UN Declaration, in the Universal Declaration, sorry. Uh, and these are the rights to physical integrity, which are, is the rights uh, of the body uh, to protect, be protected um, from physical harm by the state um, for political expression, essentially. Uh, we, specifically, what we, we're examining are patterns of the use of political imprisonment, uh, torture, forced disappearances, and political killing, uh, or what's referred to as extrajudicial killing, uh, by the state against uh, those civilians uh, living under the state's protection. One thing I'll note is that our study uh, is going to examine human rights practices in these, in these host states but it does not distinguish between whether or not the repression is being targeted uh, against refugees or uh, the general population, the local population, or both, uh, but rather looks at the overall uh, level of human rights practices. Uh, and that's about as technical as I'm going to get. So um, I just wanted to, to, to let you know what it is we're, uh, we're actually looking at with the outcome. So a couple of distinctions I want to make based on the, the Refugee Convention and international law. Uh, first, uh, refugees are those uh, individuals who have been displaced across state borders and have left 
their home country, uh, fleeing uh, violence or persecution, uh, and seeking refuge in another state. Uh, which is distinguished by uh, internally displaced persons uh, who have fled their home and sought safety within uh, at another location within their own country. Uh, the guiding principle of the UN Refugee Convention uh, is the principle of non-refoulement, which is this idea that if uh, a person is granted refugee status in a host state, they cannot be forced to go back to their home state uh, if they still fear for uh, their own safety, right? If there's reason to fear persecution or for their own safety, they cannot be sent back. And this is an important distinction. This is part of the process uh, that starts that policy uh, uh, by the UNHCR, which is the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, uh, that Ashley laid out. Uh, as of the end of 2015, uh, there are 37 million people internally displaced across the world, uh, including uh, a little over 16 million refugees, uh, according to the UNHCR. Uh, some have said that this is the largest refugee crisis uh, since World War II. Uh, and there are a couple of things, uh, general trends, um, to, to think about uh, with uh, the experience of refugees, uh, which is that a lot of refugees um, experience inadequate living conditions once they enter into the host state. Uh, camps are underfunded according to UNHCR standards and goals. Uh, they uh, have inadequate food, shelter, medicine, and economic opportunity. Um, and this is uh, perhaps maybe best characterized even in a state of uh, high economic capacity like France uh, and the recent um, experience in the Calais camps, um, which were recently uh, demolished. So what we're trying to do uh, is understand what effect hosting refugees has on the human rights practices within those host states. And what we're really trying to get at is from a humanitarian <coughs> perspective, uh, are refugees ex simply exchanging one form of a dangerous situation and entering into another, right? Are they actually finding uh, refuge in terms of physical integrity uh, and human rights in this host state? Turn it over to Shweta now. Right. And uh, so basically, we theorize and we find in our research that uh, as as number of refugees entering a host country increases, uh, that state's human rights practices, both towards refugees as well as towards the local population, is going to worsen as well. Right. And we think that, that there are a couple of reasons for why that's happening. One is that um, refugees, uh, given uh, sort of what um, Thorin said, that, uh, that refugee, uh, refugee communities experience uh, scarcity in terms of economic opportunity, have pretty, uh, performed pretty low in terms of socioeconomic uh, indicators, poverty, unemployment, so on and so forth. And so there might be grievances amongst the refugee communities in, in, in host countries, right? One is that. Second is that we feel that there might actually be a lot of grievances uh, and dissent amongst the, the local population of that host state towards refugees, right? And we saw some of that in uh, the campaign, in the Trump campaign, in the run-up to the presidential elections. Uh, this was a famous photograph in Hungary of the Hungarian photographer tripping up, uh, you know, refugees as they were fleeing, um, I think, law enforcement. Uh, we see the big anti-refugee uh, demonstrations that took place in Dresden and Berlin in, in Germany. Uh, we're seeing uh, so much scapegoating by Mary Le Pen uh, in, in France uh, towards refugees in the run-up to the, to the French elections. So we see a lot of grievances uh, emerge in the, in the local population vis-a-vis -vis, uh, refugees as well, which <coughs> local politicians may use to dehumanize and otherize uh, refugee populations. And so as a uh, number of refugees in a host country increases, and as grievances both amongst refugees and amongst the local population potentially increase as well, states 
potentially respond to that dissent and respond to those potential grievances by violating physical integrity rights and by uh, and by worsening their human rights practices, right? So if you have demonstrations or if you have potential dissent going on in a host country, states are going to use repressive practices to, to clamp down on the dissent, whether it's actually happening or whether it's potentially going to happen. There's only one condition that we found in our research that we felt sort of moderated uh, that, that relationship. That is when, if a host country has high economic capacity, meaning uh, that host country is rich, it has a lot of economic <coughs> opportunities, it's advanced uh, in terms of its economic development, we find that uh, that state's human rights practices may not um, may not uh, worsen that much, that the relationship between hosting large numbers of refugees and increases in repression is moderated by economic capacity. So uh, our argument there is that these, uh, these economically capable states uh, are uh, better able to sort of absorb the, the economic um, competition or potential economic stress that, uh, that may occur if, if refugee populations are coming in, it may, uh, it may, uh, these states may have other ways of uh, of managing grievances and managing dissent apart from using, you know, uh, extrajudicial killings and political imprisonment and so on and so forth. And that leads us to, uh, to offer certain uh, policy implications from from our research around uh, the relationship between hosting refugees and human rights practices. Yeah, so the largest uh, implication that we can take from this, um, you know, one would be to, to a, a simple one would be, well, if you want better human rights practices, then you don't take in refugees. I think that that would be correct, especially given uh, the moderating impact that we uh, found for uh, states of higher economic capacity. I think what the, the biggest implication for this from a humanitarian perspective uh, is that states with higher economic capacity um, should be taking in more refugees, not fewer refugees. And uh, that this burden, uh, unfortunately, um, in this particular uh, crisis, uh, is not really going in that direction. So we've got this chart from Fox, uh, which is a breakdown of UNHCR data. And on the left side uh, are the what are referred to as the sending states. These are the states that uh, are currently uh, embroiled in civil wars and civil conflict um, from which re refugees are fleeing. And on the right side, uh, we have the countries of asylum or the host states. These are the states, the sample of states that we're, we're most concerned with. And as you can see, the distribution uh, of the states will focus in on the Syrian conflict. Uh, uh, the majority of Syrian refugees uh, have taken shelter in Turkey. Uh, the next uh, highest up state for that particular conflict is Lebanon, followed by Jordan, which are all neighboring states. Right? This is not uh, an unusual trend uh, in where refugees go. Right? The closest place is often uh, the most economically and physically feasible uh, for refugees. Um, and you can see that there is some portion of them that have gone down into other, and this is where uh, European countries in the United States, <coughs> right? And what we see from this is that neighboring states uh, are hosting the bulk of refugees. Uh, that's not necessarily uh, bad, but uh, from our uh, researcher's perspective, uh, one potential issue is that uh, these neighboring states uh, are often uh, that neighboring uh, states that neighbor civil conflict uh, and civil conflict tends to emerge in regions of states uh, that also have similar levels of economic and bureaucratic uh, capacity. Uh, and so what we end up observing are, in this particular crisis uh, are that refugees are concentrating uh, in states of lower capacity, which from a human rights perspective um, and our research indicates that that may not be good for going forward for the human rights uh, uh, practices of those states. Uh, what we would uh, encourage is that, and take away from this, is that those that variation in the economic conditions 
of where refugees goes matters for how refugees experience um, uh, life uh, in in this uh, <coughs> uh, refuge place. So, with that in mind, we want to think about what that means more broadly, right? So, if variation across countries in terms of economic capacity matters, that means uh, that it's not just that those countries are wealthy. What we think is going on also is that these countries can have different kinds of programs uh, for hosting refugees that can uh, help uh, mitigate against some of these uh, tensions that happen, such as a resettlement program as opposed to camps. That's one variation uh, among many uh, on different types of refugee policies. But even within those uh, uh, more economically capable states, we still observe uh, scapegoating uh, we still observe otherization, uh, an us versus them uh, discourse that occurs. Uh, we think in general that these more economically capable <coughs> states um, can <coughs> essentially handle that kind of uh, discourse without resorting to greater amounts of repression. But nevertheless, there is extreme. There is quite a bit of variation across uh, these uh, more economically capable states, and even within those economically capable states. So there's other concerns uh, that we want to also focus on. And so uh, going from that, I guess I just wanted to share uh, some local data from what our organization in Portland uh, does, where uh, the African refugee community in Portland put together uh, a survey and surveyed their community to, to sort of see what the lived experiences of refugees in Portland, Oregon were. And, and you find that you know, there's sort of justified reasons for, for grievances amongst refugee communities, though what it, our research suggests that this actually can be sort of managed and solved in sort of peaceful, democratic ways that doesn't impinge on you know, <coughs> human rights of, of folks. So what you see here from 2011 is the refugee community in, in Portland, Oregon, saying that they have big economic grievances, that 74% of them said that they don't earn enough money to pay for their basic needs. Uh, and uh, you know, only around 4% uh, said that they're doing all right in terms of their, their <coughs> economic uh, subsistence. right? And that sort of carried forward in uh, the way we see wages and incomes working in uh, the African refugee community vis-a-vis -vis the white population in, in Portland, Oregon, where on the one hand, the African refugee community in Portland is one of the higher educated communities. A lot of refugees come in with advanced degrees, with, with college degrees, right? Because it's not that they're, they're not economic migrants, they're, they're refugees, they're fleeing persecution, right? Uh, but as you notice, um, their, uh, their wages are, you know, less than half of, or, or almost less than half as what the white population makes in Portland. So uh, we end up uh, thinking about the implications of, uh, in terms of human rights uh, from the point of view of racism and uh, xenophobia and how these communities experience their lives even in economically uh, capable states such as, such as the United States. So even after we're done sort of thinking about repression, we move on to really thinking about how the people, how refugee communities sort of live their lives um, after fleeing their, their homes. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. So. We have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, maybe I'll start us off real quick. Um, so what are the, the legal obligations that states have to take in their refugees? And also, uh, or are there any? <laughs> because, you know, I, I assume some of these treaties have been signed have legal obligations. Um, and, and what are the uh, legal requirements of states that host refugees? Are, are, or are there the states do whatever they want with them? Do, you know, do they have to give them citizen you know, access to citizenship rights, work, etc., or what? 
Well, uh, I'm not an international law expert, uh, so I'll, I'll note that I don't uh, have uh, too many specifics. What uh, I will say is the general trend among human rights treaties is that compliance is up to the signing state, right? And while the these treaties have uh, the ability to monitor compliance, most of the time what that means is that those member states to those conventions uh, file reports with the UN agency uh, that monitors compliance with the particular treaty. And then <coughs> that's about it, right? So that's about as much enforcement uh, of this as uh, so the if the U.S. Has. said we are not going to take any refugees, there's no legal requirement. That they there, there's very little to do. I mean, aside from the fact that there may be domestic law that also covers this, right? So, uh, I, and that I don't know. Uh, but what the UNHCR generally does is specify targets uh, for uh, different host countries. Uh, and I'll note that, um, so this is from a report uh, by Oxfam. Uh, citing UNHCR data that as of the end of uh, 2016, uh, the U.S. had, had uh, fulfilled about 10% of the UNHCR goal uh, for uh, hosting Syrian refugees. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, had taken in uh, about 13%. Note, uh, I, I mentioned the Calais uh, camps in northern France. That Those camps were... Uh, people who were trying to get into the UK. Right? They weren't all refugees from Syria, but they, they were uh, individuals largely trying to get in, into the United Kingdom. Uh, in contrast, uh, our friendly neighbor to the north, Canada, uh, has taken in 248% uh, of its goals at the end of 2016. So there is variation on this. Um, so not every state is under uh, what the UNHCR goals are. Uh, the UNHCR goal for the United States was somewhere around 100,000 uh, Syrian refugees. So obviously we're over, a over bit, what year period? Uh, over, I'm not actually sure. Um, so when you talk about um, the us versus them mentality that we create um, by creating this rhetoric about refugees or this or that. Um, does nationalism go into the motivate or into, you know, fueling that us versus them on the side of Americans? Um, so I was actually going to give a different example of uh, of Hungary, um, where a lot of Hungary's um, us versus them dynamic has been uh, has been around um, sort of religious nationalism, right? So so this idea of Hungary as a as a Christian country and how uh, taking in Muslim refugees is going to dilute the, the, the Christian nature of, of the country. And I guess you see some of that in, in the U.S. over the last, in, uh, in the travel ban, right? Like the first travel ban executive order that was put out had an exception for, for Christian refugees. So uh, nationalism is a pretty broad term and those, the bases of nationalism can be different, right? It could be sort of rac racial nationalism. Um, it could be uh, religious nationalism. So you definitely see that, you know, sort of come up in um, in both Hungary and the U.S. Um, even with sort of the and, and and a big part of nationalism is us versus them, right? Like uh, it, the the very basis of nationalism is creating a cohesive identity of a country vis-a-vis -vis the world, right? And uh, part of that. Part of the uh, the dynamic of nationalism also becomes, you know, valorizing us as glorifying ourselves and dehumanizing the others. And that Skittles example is a very good sort of illustration of that. Somebody over here. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you speak to the the growing phenomenon of how different well-off countries are outsourcing their refugee problems? <coughs> For example, the United States, um, the agreement with Mexico to, you know, head off migration to the United States uh, when unaccompanied children from um, um, gang violence uh, from neighborhoods in, in Honduras and El Salvador and just different countries, Australia, Christmas Island, you know, the outlying um, islands and how the United Nations is dealing with that. Is there a response to this um, kind of delegation of 
outsourcing the refugee problem. So, I don't know if any of us have a direct answer to that. I'll, I'll answer that one. Okay. Um, so there are um, so there are countries who are outsourcing the refugee problem, and I'll speak with that in just a second. Just a, just a second. Um, but I will note that um, what what uh, what my colleagues' research uh, study here, and what I what I was talking about, and the refugee issue that we were that we are experts on is is a different in it's a different phenomenon than immigration via legal immigration or illegal immigration uh, in both time and substance and in um, the way in which countries deal with it. Uh, and in um, the international structure uh, that requires countries or asks countries to participate in this, these inflows of different populations. Um, but with that said, <coughs> Um, there are countries that do outsource or are attempting to outsource the refugee problem. Um, we've seen this in Europe where um, uh, some of the northern European countries, um, which have taken in substantial amounts of refugees um, in the last couple of years, so I don't want to um, uh, uh, deride their, their contribution, uh, but some of them have uh, recently tried to uh, incentivize uh, Turkey keeping um, refugees. Greece keeping refugees, hungry keeping refugees through payment programs, through different incentivizations to stop flows from reaching um, their borders. Um, and that is an issue that um, <coughs> I don't know exactly how the UN is responding to that, but it is a growing problem. Um, I'll add on to that. Um, you, also see, um, you also see countries such as the Northern European countries um, sort of disincentivizing refugees from coming there in the first place, right? So if you remember, um, there was a big uh, to-do um, in Denmark, I think it was, where they said that they would take sort of the jewelry and like liquid assets of, of refugees to, to make them pay for their um, entry and their settlement in, in Denmark, right? And there was a lot of justifiable comparison to concentration camps and how people's assets were taken away from them um, and you know from what uh, the rhetoric afterwards suggested that it wasn't really that they were going to do it it was just you know a conservative politician floated this idea in in their legislature but it was more about signaling to you know refugee communities out there to say do not come here right because we, you're not welcome here uh, the other piece uh, that I've been hearing very anecdotally about is the whole principle of non uh the idea that countries cannot send back refugees, right? Like, um, and there's, uh, there's a sense in some countries of uh, sort of encouraging voluntary repatriation, meaning encouraging refugees who are in those countries to, to go back, right? And so sort of trying to work within existing legal frameworks to, to find a way to make refugees go back. Maybe maybe similar to sort of what uh, the US is doing, um, you know, with um, undocumented immigrants in this country, which is, you know, things are going to get really hard here, so you all should go back before ICE comes and gets you. Um, so maybe, maybe so you don't know this, what is the, the approximate cost of reselling a refugee in the US? <coughs> I can't give you a dollar number, but I will say this. Um, the refugees pay. This is not something that the U.S. pays. So once the U.S. admits um, refugees into, into this country, um, they are required to provide for their own, to take their own transportation to the U.S. Um, and then once in the U.S. to reach to pay for provide their transportation wherever they go. Sometimes, um, um, and actually not even sometimes, um, on, on a fairly regular basis that is picked up by an NGO or by some other organization. But the, the U.S. government is rarely paying those costs. Uh, and one thing I'll add on to that is that uh, in addition to the, the actual financial burden of the process, uh, it takes on average between 18 and 24 months uh, to go through that process. So every, uh, uh, say, refugee that, that enters into the, actually physically uh, enters into the U.S. as a designated refugee, uh, started the process between 18 and two years, 18 months and two years ago. Uh, so that's that, that's a another big part of uh, um, 
why we don't, why the U.S. takes on average 80,000 refugees as opposed to more. I was curious, you guys talked about the us versus them rhetoric and then also just misperception in the United States. How do we as a country, in your opinion, start to make people understand some of those misperceptions and work to a place where people maybe don't buy into the rhetoric as easily just because they don't know? Uh, I'll note that this is really hard. Um, I was at a workshop of, of people who research uh, refugees and humanitarian aid uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this was kind of a roundtable, free flow discussion was just about this topic. Um, and we didn't come up with a, a great answer. One, you know, uh, this is the biggest audience I've ever spoken to um, <laughs> as an academic, right? So we don't we don't have a lot of um, public influence. Although, thank you very much for getting extra credit in Ashley's class. <laughs> uh, we appreciate it. Uh, uh, what I try to do is uh, employ the classroom as a way to uh, critically evaluate how we use language uh, to understand uh, political situations and sensitive topics, right? So um, there are a lot of uh, ways that, that issues like this um, are characterized and uh, a way that provides maybe a heuristic uh, or a shortcut, a way for us to more easily understand whatever the concept in the classroom is, um, but it can also be problematic in any number of ways. Uh, so one example is that um, refugee research in political science, uh, in kind of a systematic way, in forced migration research in political science, has often been linked to uh, the study of how uh, civil wars become internationalized and potentially move across borders. Uh, well, in that, even in the scholarly literature, which is known for uh, a lot of jargon and nuance, um, will still kind of fall into the trap of relying on overly simplistic heuristics uh, and things like biological metaphors, right? So. Um, there's a headline that we, we almost included in this from the Atlantic about 11 years ago and, uh, that referred to refugees as carriers of conflict as though it is a, a, a disease, right? And it's not. It's, a, it's a, the result of choices um, by people with agency, right? And so uh, that by itself is, is difficult. Um, and I, that's all I can, I'll, I'll add in. I'll, I'll stop for now, but this is, I think, a great question, uh, and one we don't have a great answer to, and one that I'd really uh, like to Sorry, talk well, more about. I'll, I'll so. add a little bit to that and say uh, maybe you know there's there's that piece, and then I'm going to wear my activist hat now yeah. and say there's there's the daily sort of activism of it, right? Like the fact that you all showed up here, uh, whether it was you know free choice under a coercive framework. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, hopefully, um, you know, you take this forward, right? And so, when somebody in in your um, uh, in your space, you know, sort of talks about refugees in uh, in an uninformed way, disrupt it, right? Say what you like, say what you have learned, and then you know, engage with and and disrupt it, right? Uh, it's similar to sort of. Uh, at least in, in uh, you know, get involved in um, sort of justice conversations. So if somebody's talking, if somebody's being a racist, then chance are they're also being xenophobic against refugees. So like disrupt those conversations and you, you begin to build a bigger us and a smaller them, if that makes sense. Right here, right here. My question is for you, Dr. Johnson. Um, you were talking about uh, how the forced out process is 80% like of refugees coming to the United States. What is the process for the other 20%? Um, so Cuba and Haiti have a special status. Um, so Cuban um, and Haitian refugees um, enter in through a different process. And so that makes up the vast majority of the percentage of others. Um, um, this is, these are individuals who, who enter under as officially recognized refugees under yeah. U.S. About 80% of the people who are 
or Cuban and Haitian. I'll also note there's another process, which is if an individual comes in on a visitor visa uh, and applies for asylum uh, or a work visa or something like that, and that is a different process. It doesn't go through uh, the process that uh, that uh, Professor Townsend described. <coughs> it's weird saying that we went to school together. <laughs> um, it's, it's cool. Um, uh, you can call him Ashley. If you don't uh, <laughs> Ashley Adam. Um, so, uh, it, but that goes through a legal process where uh, an INS judge makes that decision on whether or not to grant asylum and. Uh, uh, political science actually researched that as well, although those, the, the summary of findings of that is different. And I want to make just one more thing on that. Um, uh, so Syrian uh, refugees get the headlines now. Uh, the Syrians do not make up the majority of the refugees that the U.S. takes in under that 80%. And in fact, for the last two years, 2015, 2016, it's uh, refugees from the Congo, uh, the, deep, uh, the DRC Congo. Refugees that are coming out of the Congo and uh, that have made up the um, as well. And in Syria, it makes up a sizable portion, but not. We get somebody over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you had actually mentioned religious nationalism before, and uh, I wanted to give like a potential example. If you had thought about a country like Israel, that's a really like strong approach to uh, religious nationalism. How would you encourage them to sort of? take in more of a refugee population or approach the issue. I, mean, I would imagine they have like the biggest us versus them sort of mentality. I feel like Israel takes a very small proportion of, of refugees, right? Yeah, I feel really, like... From what I know, they're pretty restrictive on who they Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, uh, I don't have an answer to that apart from knowing that, uh, <clears throat> yeah, for, for a country that's you know, smart dab in the middle of, of conflicts, they, uh, yeah, don't take in many, very many refugees at all. And um, uh, to what extent that's because of uh, sort of Zionist nationalism, or to what extent that's, uh, you know, most of the refugees are probably Palestinian and are, are staying in Israel and, or, or those of whom who are staying in Israel are staying in contested territories anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't think I've a better answer for that. In the, in the back there. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned that, and I certainly understand why I don't like it, but people fear diluting the American culture, the religion, and customs of that. Um, first of all, is that, those are the same reasons that they were forced from their home country? Uh, and secondly, if people are here long enough, does that familiarity breed acceptance and tolerance? So I'll, I'll answer, try to answer the first one. Um, but I think that um, in a very broad underlying sense, that can be why refugees were forced out of it, that left their, uh, their country originally. But, for the most part, refugees that we're uh, that they have, that they research in their paper and that I was speaking about, um, they face physical danger. So they're not leaving because of um, not leaving because of potential uh, discrimination or uh, inequality uh, based on some sort of ethnic disparity. They're they they are generally fleeing because they are worried for their lives. Um, these are not economic refugees. These are physical safety. Um, now, underlying that, the cause of that conflict may be ethnic differences or us uh, versus the country. Yeah, I assume the whatever. It depends on the conflict. Um, uh, what was the second part of your question? Um, is is there a hope that, like with other groups that have come to America, the Irish, the Polish, the Italian, that familiarity with these groups will breed tolerance and acceptance eventually? Um, I think one of the, the advantages of uh, the refugee resettlement programs in the U.S. has been the extent to which, you know, they've emphasized the integration piece. Um, so, yes. Uh, and I think I, I would distinguish between integration and assimilation, right? Because assimilation means um, assimilating into white dominant mainstream culture, which a lot of people may not want to do, right? Um, in, in my local uh, experience um, in Portland, uh, we've 
notice that uh, the refugee communities really just want um, to lead happy socioeconomic lives, right? They want jobs, they want their education, their educational credentials to be recognized so that doctors can continue to be doctors and lawyers can <coughs> continue to be lawyers, that they can send their kids to school. Um, and to a certain extent, in that sense, they actually find more solidarity with um, with the African American community or with like other local communities of color who are, you know, fighting racism and fighting those inequities in society. So I feel like that is the key to um, to sort of refugees, you know, to, to peace and tolerance and, and all those lovely things, right? Which is how do we uh, how do we uh, include uh, the, the grievances and, and the lives of refugee uh, experiences in the way we talk about racial equity, in the way we talk about equity of, of gender and sexuality in this country? Okay, time for one last question. Let me get somebody to pass an answer in the back there, yeah. Uh, Dr. Thompson, when you mentioned uh, that refugees don't have a relationship uh, with terrorism, it sounded like to me that you were able to isolate the group that did have a relationship I'm not, I can't remember if you said it was a particular group of refugees or not, but can you elaborate on the demographics or anything about that particular group? So there's nothing demographic about it. Um, the only relationship that shows up empirically um, is that um, concentrations of refugees in areas directly next to the conflict in which they come from can lead to increases in terrorist activity. So what I mean here, um, using Syria for example, is that um, refugee concentrations right across the border in Turkey and Lebanon and in Jordan um, can lead to increased terrorist activity in those areas. Now, I want to caveat that a little bit because in actuality, the terrorist activity that we see increased is about 50-50 split between um, terrorist activity against the host states and terrorist activity against the refugees. So um, it's not as if the refugees are like, um, uh, are causing the spike in terrorism. And in fact, for about 50% of all the terrorist activity that we did, we see increase after these, uh, these, these, these relocations. About 50% of the attacks are against the refugees themselves. Um, the relationship we do not see is once you leave the conflict zone, um, the relationship between terrorism and refugee populations and terrorism and refugee flows almost in the real no relationship at all. So once we enter in, again, from the Syrian views in the same example, once we enter into like the European zone, the US zone, the Canadian zone, there's no there's no statistical empirically found relationship between increases in refugee flows and terrorism. I want to follow up a little bit on this. Um, so uh, and it's a dynamic that we didn't uh, get into in our talk, but we've highlighted a recommended book. Um, and so please go, let's go read it uh, if you want to. It's not written by us. So it's not written by us, yeah. It's not, uh, so, so, so one dynamic, and, and this occurs uh, in uh, refugee situations as well as other uh, uh, periods of uh, internal displacement as well as external displacement like refugees, uh, which is that these become zones of concentrations of humanitarian aid. And uh, we could, you know, if you guys want, we can stay for another hour and talk about the politics of aid uh, and how it relates back to contentious politics within these, uh, within both uh, conflict zones or, or zones of low uh, state capacity, which is that humanitarian aid becomes, or can become, it does not always become, but it can become uh, either a lootable resource uh, or um, a good uh, f through which states uh, essentially buy support of their, their support coalition. So it's either a source of non-tax revenue from the state or it's a, lootable, a potential lootable resource, which means that these zones can become uh, targets for violence because of those resources that they have, right? Uh, and when we observe in these data sets uh, instances of violence, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to distinguish just from those observations uh, exactly what's, uh, what's going on there. So I'll note that. So, go ahead. No. Okay. 
So uh, our time's up now. Let me uh, remind you and invite you to come to our two events next week. Uh, it's on Tuesday at noon. We will be talking about the French uh, election. And then on Thursday in the Cub Auditorium at 6 p.m., we'll be airing uh, Tickling Giants. And those of you who want to go hear uh, your fellow uh, students who are Democrats and Republicans and Libertarians debate uh, the direction of America in the era of Trump, that's tonight at 8 p or 7 p.m. Sorry, in the Cub Auditorium. Now, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Join me in thanking our guests for a really interesting conversation.